Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to Louis Lessons, a virtual conversation concert series featuring esteemed pianist, rock and tour, and KCH favorite Louis Nagel. This series has been generously funded by season underwriters Maurice and Linda Binko. This presentation is free, but please consider supporting our world class artists and our Carytown Concert House by making your own gift at carytownconcerthouse.com slash donate. Enjoy the program. Hello, everybody. Once again, a Louis lesson. Uh, and this, this program actually came about because two or three of my friends, having heard the last program on the Pathétique, asked me if I would build on that and talk a little bit more about uh, the Sonata. Now, the title of this program, as with so many of my talks, uh, the title came first, and then I had to make a, uh, uh, a lecture or a talk out of it. Sonatomy, which uh, is a combination of sonata and anatomy, and it has to do with the concept of form. Now, this is a very elusive topic, and it's I think it's a very interesting uh, concept about sonata form. Most of you who are listening undoubtedly had a music appreciation course that went something like this. We're going to look at a sonata today. Sonata is made up of three sections. It's a tripart form. We have an exposition which presents two themes uh, and a development section which develops the material you can't use the same word to define itself, but most classes do that. And a recapitulation, which goes back to the beginning and then the movement ends. That would be an, anal an analogy would be to uh, go to a doctor who tells you that your anatomy is head, torso, and extremities. I'm not sure that I would want that doctor taking out my appendix are doing brain surgery, particularly. There is so much more to it than that. There, is as, there are as many sonata forms as there are sonatas. Let me tell you a little anecdote that comes from my second year as a student at Juilliard. I came into the class which we called Literature and Materials of Music. I've mentioned that before on these talks. L&M, which also happened to be the brand of a cigarette at that time. But the L&M classes at Juilliard were quite revolutionary at their time. And this particular teacher was, a, he was as tough as nails. He was demanding. He took no prisoners. His name was Hugh Aitken. And he left a tremendous impression upon me and I think probably every student that went through his classes. Here's how tough he was. He gave us an exam once, an objective exam of 100 questions. Things like dates, identification of composers, meanings of words, things like that. 100 questions. If you got everything right, your grade was a C. If you got too wrong, you flunked. If that sounds draconian, indeed it was, but his rationale of teaching was that these 100 questions are material that every musician who plans to be professional ought to know. Why should you get credit like an A or an A minus for knowing this material. This is the average amount of <coughs> material that a person should know. Well, that may be good or bad teaching. I don't know how you would receive that, but it left an indelible impression upon me. The idea that sonata can be categorized as simplistically as exposition, development, and recapitulation, and there you have it, was something that he very quickly debunked and came into class one day and said, there is no such thing as sonata form. 
And of course, all of us were as if we were standing in front of a minister or a rabbi or an imam who said there is no God. What he was again trying to show us with his abrupt way is that you must look at each piece and evaluate what you hear rather than assume that it's all going to fall into some kind of predetermined form. And that, too, left an indelible impression upon me. So today, what I'd like to do is to look at one of the conventional sonatas, one that might have been a model for the three forms that you got in the music appreciation class. That's not wrong, by the way. There's nothing wrong with that statement any more than there's anything wrong with head, torso, and extremities. That's true. But if that's where it stops, you're missing the point. So I'd like to take a look at one of the conventional sonatas of Beethoven and play for you its first movement, talk about it a little bit, and then play, building again on the pathetique from last time, play and discuss and play the moonlight from this time. I should say also, so far as the use of the word sonata, it simply means a sound piece. It, it, when it came into uh, common parlance with, I guess, Corelli around 1640 or so, it didn't mean this kind of music. It was a term that differentiated from the word cantare, cantata, or toccare, toccata. They just suggested different uh, approaches to making music. A sound piece doesn't tell you very much. Gradually, the concept of sonata worked its way into uh, compositions for some sort of solo, a violin with keyboard, or keyboard alone, or flute with keyboard, and composers from Bach on used that term. We have 20th century composers like Alban Berg, uh, Alberto Ginastera, Samuel Barber, uh, Norman Della Gioio, Alberto Ginastera. All of these composers used the word sonata. It's evolved through the centuries. This would be the prototype from which those pieces either digressed or enlarged. I'm going to be playing for you the first movement of one of my favorite Beethoven sonatas, Opus 14, number two. And just to give you a little guideline before playing, it's a short movement, playing the whole thing, the whole first movement, uh, to give you what, what we are going to be listening for from the standpoint of sections in the piece. We have an opening tune in the key of G major. We call that the tonic key. <laughs> starts to go on a little trip as if it were leaving its house in the morning and going on to work. And as it's going on its trip, it's modulating. It's leaving the home key. I'm slowing down. Sharp is taking us out of our neighborhood of G major. And now we're floating on the dominant of D. Now we're in the key of D, and it's a new tune. But in the process of getting there, we've had a lot of motives. Now let's not only talk about themes or tunes. We've had some motives, ideas that get developed, that get used, that get tossed around throughout the sonata. Here's our second tonal center. I prefer to use tonal center, the theme. <laughs> This sounds almost 
almost like a, a Rossini aria to me. It is so beautiful. You would not expect this to be Beethoven. <laughs> some music that takes us through that theme. I'm not going to play the whole movement just yet. And we get to something that the theoreticians or the uh, analysts would call a closing theme. This is a third theme. So the notion of two themes in the exposition kind of goes out the window, even with this convention. section, and that is the exposition. So that part of your music appreciation course is absolutely correct. We call this the exposition. The essence of the sonata is not the number of tunes or themes or motives or whatever. The essence of the sonata from the beginnings of its use up through the 20th century is the conflict. It's a dramatic form, and it's the conflict between at least two tonal centers. And that's an important point. Here we have, may not sound like a war, but it's the ascendancy. Which of these keys is going to be ascendant? I'm always reminded when I talk about this with the great series of, of shows, Perry Mason, where he and Hamilton Berger duked it out over the airwaves. Hamilton Berger was the dominant key he always had whom he knew was the criminal, and Perry Mason was the tonic key. He always won. But it's the interaction between the two and the courtroom scenes which often were fraught with tension and drama. And you'll hear drama in this otherwise innocent, beautiful piece. When I'm not going to play the development section. Uh, I, I don't want to give the whole sonata movement away before playing it. But in a development section, the one thing that happens, whether it's short or long, is modulation, key change, rapid key change. They're fighting to use to keep the analogy going. They're, they're having a, a conversation, is putting it mildly. And sometimes we go into pretty wild keys. This development section somehow ends up starting a part of it in A flat, which is miles away from G major. And apparently Beethoven played this, according to Czerny, with a lot of vigor and, and fire and energy. In contrast and in conflict, conflict with the sweetness of the opening. I don't want to play it for you, at least yet. But that's what you will hear. And then you will hear a section that I do just want to illustrate. Uh, <clears throat> in order to get us back to the tonic, to get us back to the tonic, we have a section of, of uh, measures of music that very often, not always, but very often in Beethoven, is a pedal point. <laughs> And then it stops on this totally illogical note of C sharp, which takes us to back. It's so smooth, it's so silky smooth what Beethoven does with the material. And the recapitulation is, in this particular sonata, a recasting of the beginning, but not modulating. 
Perry Mason has won. So there is a sense of staying in the tonic key, and there's a brief coda, tail, just a few measures of music at the end of the first movement that sum up the atmosphere and the, the tonal center and bring the music, the first movement of the music, to conclusion. Now, what would we have done with this before I play it? What would he have done this, this, with this in Hugh Aitken's L&M class? We would have analyzed by naming the harmony of every note in the piece. Tedious, but very informative. We would be asked in maybe open discussion to explain the relationship between the beginning of the development section, which is in G minor, and then A flat, and then it goes to E flat. How do these keys fit in? What's the connection? Is there any motivic connection between sections? We would be asked to understand what's going on and hear everything, listen to and hear everything that we could possibly hear. His mantra to us always, if we are performers, we have to perform what we hear, not what a textbook tells us to do. I can't do a better job of talking about music than Hugh Aitken did back in the 1960s when I had two years of classes with him and was an assistant, teaching assistant for him for one year where he put me through some more rigors and demanded more from me. And I'll never forget that. So I'd like to share some of that class and this first movement of the Beethoven Opus 14, number two, Piano Sonata.
Thank you. I don't know whether you could see me smiling when I was playing that, but this piece never fails whether I hear it or play it. I haven't played it in a long, long time, but there is humor. And there is much that I haven't shared with you. This is not possible to share everything. But even the very, very beginning, we don't know what the meter is. We really don't know. He's playing games with our expectations. And some of the tunes are just so lovely. They're just so warm. And then that development section, as you heard, well, I didn't want to play it for you. All of a sudden, all you know what breaks loose. And we have the left hand pounding out the theme and the right hand playing what I've always called rattle music, just uh, that sort of thing. It was great piano writing in 1801 when this sonata appeared, 1800, I believe when this sonata first appeared. This was the way pianism became virtuosic. You made a lot of sound, but the left hand was tossing this theme around and playing and extending it and expanding it. And he's taking something that was so beautiful and turning it into a small tiger. And then we come back to the beginning as if nothing ever happened. And that stopping. Uh, We could stay there a long time, because you want. But is that still the development, or is this the beginning of the recap? He's teasing us. Here's Beethoven before he has to admit next year, 1802, or two years. I, I don't remember exactly when this appeared. Beethoven, two years from now, writes the Heiligenstadt Testament and admits to the world that he's deaf. He's already having hearing problems, but he is at the top of his game as a pianist, as an improviser, becoming at the top of his game as a composer. As historians regard him, he is entering what we call the, the middle period. Uh, we're going to hear an early example from the middle period in just a few minutes when I play the Moonlight Sonata for you. And you're going to hear how very, very different this sonata is. Now, it's not that all the other sonatas are either this or that. He wrote 32 piano sonatas, and every one of them is an individual work. No two are anywhere exactly alike. And in that sense, they are so human. They represent such humanity. There's no formula. There's no form into which he poured the notes of a sonata. He wrote what his heart and soul felt. And there are times where he felt the, just the joie de vivre and how beautiful life was with that sonata. And there are times when he wrote. <laughs> That's very argumentative, right there at the beginning. And of course, he wrote the last five sonatas, which all five exist on the top of Mount Everest with the Hammer Clavier and Opus 111, sharing the same peak, but not at all the same gestures. Uh, notice I'm not illustrating those. That's, that's for a different, a different time in my life. All right. On we can go to the Moonlight Sonata. Uh, some of you listening probably have heard me play this again. I, I, without any embarrassment, admit I love to play this sonata. I love to hear it. Uh, what's interesting about it is apparently in its first appearance as a printed work, the time signature was wrong. And I have to admit that I learned this piece when I was very young. And the marking is Adagio Sostenuto. And the, just make sure that I have, 
We all know how this begins, but I'm checking the, the Adagio Sostenuto. And there are two things about the beginning that I'll share with you. But Adagio Sostenuto in four would be something like this. Which takes about three days to do. And it's not very interesting. The original temple marking from Beethoven is what we call alla breve, cut time. So there are two pulses. There may be four quarter notes in a measure, but we pulse it in two, which is essentially twice as fast. Which makes the melody when it comes up. So that's one thing about the sonata that's important. The other is the marking, which in English is roughly translated as played with the utmost delicacy with pedal throughout. Now, I've got very, very close friends who insist that you can do this. But let me play a little of this with the pedal throughout, which means don't lift the pedal. Don't leave. Come back. Come back. I'm not going to continue. That, in my opinion, is not what works on a Steinway concert grand. It may work on a period piano, on a Broadwood, or an Erard. But even there, I have tried it. My ear won't let me accept it. But I have friends who absolutely believe it. But what is important is that the pedal up to this point was not usually used. It's not that it wasn't used, but it wasn't usually used. And the touch in piano playing before this time was more of an articulato kind of touch. Uh, something like. Instead of. You wouldn't pedal that in Mozart. But with Beethoven, the concept of legato and sustaining a melody was paramount in his writing. And this movement, this famous moonlight movement, which he did not call moonlight at all, he would be rolling in his grave if he could hear it, about this being called moonlight. But the idea is that this is a long vocal, or oboe, or violin, or viola line that can be sustained under a song without words type of accompaniment. So we have this. And the technical problem here is to keep the accompaniment very quiet. And the fifth finger, the poor fifth finger, has got to do an awful lot of beautiful uh, vocalizing at the keyboard. Interestingly enough, this movement, it's not just a, a kind of a song without words. It really works its way into an application of some of the principles of what we talked about in Sonata. When this movement gets going, we end up uh, E major to E minor. Starting to develop the idea of instable, unstable tonality. 
are some of the principles that we saw in the aforementioned 14.2 that apply to this continuous piece? There is no change in character, but there is certainly change in tonality, and there is very, very little change in dynamics. So when there is any change, it sounds almost the, the, the intensification is magnified. So there's uh, the intensification, perhaps the conflict. There's not exactly a conflict here, but there certainly is a conversation uh, that goes on. The second movement of this is very interesting, and I want to show you, because here we have Beethoven, his way of writing a sonata coming to the fore. Listen again first to the opening, and I'm going to emphasize the left hand. descending scale. And then we have uh, <clears throat> the melody is made up of part of a descending scale. And then we have a section of uh, back of your mind so when I get into the third movement. But so much of this music, as so much of all the Beethoven sonatas, have their birth in the opening measures of the piece. And it's almost as if he is writing a continuous, developing set of variations or elaborations on sometimes a very, very innocent uh, uh, shapeless at times motive. There's not an awful lot to say about until you start studying this piece and see how that is manifest. Why is this important? I don't want to go through the whole sonata and show you, but I do want to show you how that, that uh, comes back in the last movement. Why is it important? Because sonatas generally tend to be at least two movements. Beethoven wrote a few two-movement sonatas. They're more often three or four-movement sonatas. And on occasion, the most famous being the Brahms F minor sonata is a five-movement sonata. In addition, we have sonata application with concertos, symphonies, quartets, trios, chamber music, even opera arias. We have sonata principle. Uh, 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 apparent in all of these forms. And they can be of multi-movements. How do you hold a three-movement work together? What's the glue? Are you playing three separate pieces? No. In fact, I believe in, in a few cases, this particular sonata... <laughs> to me is a one movement sonata and even in the moonlight at the end of the first movement he writes the word ataka go right into the second movement and I believe the second movement don't take your hands off the keys and wait for latecomers to come in start the third movement and the third movement is a shock you hold disparate movements together by being sensitive to the glue to the material that makes that sonata belong, the, the movements of the sonata belong as a sonata in one unit. This is where analysis is so very, very important. And I have to go back to Mr. Aitken again. He showed us this. We analyzed short pieces like some Haydn sonatas, but we analyzed in excruciating detail at least sections of the Brahms Second Piano Concerto, which is a very, very hard work to deal with. And we, we studied that piece. So that by the time you get to the coda of the last movement, you feel like you've heard a work 
if the performer is well versed in its construction. This is the importance of analysis. The last movement of this sonata, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I showed you the, the uh, uh, that mode of comes. Descending line. What about the last movement? Let me play just the left hand alone. I'm not afraid of the right hand, but I want you to hear the left hand alone. the descending line. That comes from There's another tune in the last movement that's uh, exactly the same notes, but the gesture is the same. And he could have written anything. Any other composer might have done something else there. But Beethoven was using material from the beginning of the piece to unify the piece all the way into the third movement. And other unifying devices and were obvious the same key, C sharp minor, which by the way is a very, very rarely used key. Uh, one quartet that he wrote in C sharp minor, and why, I don't know, that key. And one Haydn sonata that I think is a glorious piece, but rarely played. And a couple of preludes and fugues, and an occasional movement of an E major piece. But it's a rarely used key. And here, the most famous of the Beethoven sonatas is in the key of C sharp minor. Uh, no explanation, just an interesting fact. And the last thing I'm going to say about this this particular sonata, is that its fame rests upon the first movement, which everybody in the world wants to play, at least get a good edition so that you know what the tempo is. But its brilliance introduces a new concept in the world of sonata. Up to this point, generally, the sonata first movement was the big movement. And it's not that it was so big, but the other two movements would have been maybe lighter. They would have been maybe more songful, shorter. And the last movement might have been a set of variations or a lighter rondo, as in the pathetique, whose first movement. <laughs> but it's the first movement that's heavy. Here, obviously, and I won't talk after I say this, you will hear it, obviously, the last movement is the heavy movement, and it's the one that tends to frighten people away if they would like to play the Moonlight Sonata. So I hope a performance today doesn't frighten you away, but gives you an idea of what's in this sonata other than just the beautiful, obviously beautiful first movement. Opus 27, number two, Sonata, C sharp minor.
a little bit turbulent, huh? Quite a piece. <laughs> and this is an example, and it's an early example, along with its companion piece, Opus 27, number one, uh, where the last movement, <coughs> the last movement is the dominant movement. It's, in that sense, it is much more dramatic. We get to the end, and we wait. We know what the end is going to be. Think of the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven. As wonderful as that first movement is, how it leads to the last movement, and how the last movement itself leads to the coda, which is fast and furious. It's, it's a sense of triumph over the conflict. And this is what I mean when I say it's a dramatic form. And one tends to play this movement with a kind of abandon. You, 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 you forget about being on guard. You, you get swept away. At least this is how I felt just now. Uh, uh, one, one is carried away by just the sweep, like a river rushing to, to, the, to its mouth to the sea, there is a, a dramatic excitement that the performer feels, and they must feel if they're going to play it. Otherwise, it's, a, it's an etude. It becomes a kind of a study in getting all the notes, which I certainly didn't do just now. But I don't remember playing this feeling any more excited than I did today to share this with you. Uh, there's a lot more to say. I did have one thought that I, I want to put in, as I always do, uh, my appreciation for playing here at Carytown. Uh, very often in the 19th century, music was first played in people's homes. Now, not symphonies, obviously, but leader were sung in homes, quartets were played in homes, and first uh, sonata, uh, first performances of sonatas were often played in homes or small venues like this before taken out to the public. Carytown is a model environment for presenting music from this time period. Uh, it, you, you really feel like there are, even when I know you're out there, maybe or maybe you've turned it off already, but you're out there watching on a screen, I feel very often when I play here that you're here. And I'm talking to you. And this is the way music might have been first heard. This piece might have been first heard played by Beethoven in a home. I don't, I don't know its origins. Before it was taken out to the public. Carytown is ideal for this, and I love being able to do this. Thank you for recording this, and uh, look forward to continuing uh, these talks and performances in the future. Thank you for joining us for Live at the 415 at Carytown Concert House. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter to read about our scheduled concerts, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to be notified about our newest videos and upcoming live streams. Hope you'll join us again soon.